get into much of the work and indeed a lot of the work you've, you've done as we go along. Um, you are actually in the same generation. So you were born in 1960, you were born in 1963. So you both grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, uh, you do share some, some, <laughs> some inf cultural influences uh, also being um, born and raised in this period. Um, so I, I thought we might start with talking about self-representation, uh, self the issue of self-representation in, in comics and in, in your work. Um, and looking at this screen here, um, we do see, um, I mean, looking at you, you look like a very decent gentleman, uh, esteemed <laughs> people, whereas on the screen you look sort of slightly deranged. <laughs> um, and um, of course, this has to do with the way that you represent yourself in, in, in comics form and with um, how you create personas. I think, can I just uh, say one thing? I think sure. this is not representative for how I represent myself. <laughs> because I'm, I'm more like Joe, I make myself a whole lot uglier than I do. <laughs> well, we'll see. You know, it's not the last image of you, so. Um, actually, I'm gonna turn right to the next image of you. Stefan, this is from. <laughs> from Slingel, I apologize for the uh, stamp from the uh, <laughs> library. <laughs> next, next year. <laughs> this is obviously what you're going to look like in, in one year. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time ago since I drew that. <laughs> 2017, I'll be old as the, as the hills. Yeah. You're in a hurry if you're going to look like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's still time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is from, uh, from uh, Slingel. And, um, you, when you started out in the 80s, you mostly drew for like, stories for Mad Norwegian Mag Mad, Mad Magazine and newspapers. And yeah, I also worked for some underground uh, magazines. Sure, mm. sure. And, and, uh, but you, you first started to do sort of autobiographical stuff in the mid-90s, right? Sort of no, actually, I did it as a kid, but uh, I don't yeah. know how, how relevant that is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but in, the, in the 90s, so it was when it started for real, yes. Oh, when you were in your early 30s. Then. So what, what, yeah. what brought that about? Actually, it started out, uh, it was a friend of mine and a colleague, a uh, Norwegian cartoonist named Thor Lear. It's spelled like liar. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, we went to London, and, uh, and uh, he suggested we should make um, an autobiographic story about it, a travelogue uh, in comic form, but uh, widely, <coughs> widely exaggerated. And so we did, and it was uh, it was great fun to use ourselves. It was it, it was extremely exagger exaggerated, so I wouldn't do that in that same way. But it, it gave some, yeah, it resonated. And I think that was the the grain that later grew to making more such uh, things. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in, um, in Slingel, I have another slide from this. This is uh, one of the stories from your, from your childhood. All the Th That's a typical <laughs> Norwegian childhood. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all the naughty stuff you, you, uh, you uh, <laughs> came up with, with um, traumatizing Norwegian car drivers <laughs> and um, such activities. But would you say that in your, in your later work, when you've made the auto autobiographies, when working on Olaf Ge and on, on uh, the Munch book, um, how is sort of the, the how, how you use your self-representation as a tool, how, how would you say it has changed? Because it's, 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 those are not stories about you, right? They're biographies about other people, so. Mm. No, it's, it's more to, uh, to uh, much in the same way that uh, Joe uh, uses himself in his uh, stories, that mm -hmm. is to to make uh, to show the way uh, I'm, the tricks I do or, or the way I'm telling the story because it's uh, when, when it's uh, it's not it's nonfiction mm -hmm. and I, I don't want it to seem like the the gospel truth, but I want to show what subject uh, subjective uh, subjectivity is in there. And I said this so much better when we were upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Should have recorded you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <completely>. Just play <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, also a, a, a number of things you do in, in that book, um, in, in, the, in the Munch book. Like when you go to the, to the sites where the paintings were rep uh, reputedly made and you, you sort of discuss this when you're on the site, that uh, it doesn't look like that at all. So it must have gone on in his mind. So there are, there are certain things you were able to, to do using yourself as a character in the story. Um, yeah, in, in Munch it's especially to, to just comment uh, about this, because a monkey is, is very much, uh, it's like a, a <coughs> you know, von Trier's dogma yes. rules, yeah, so that's, a, that's some rules that I set for myself, and Munke was to, uh, I, I was not allowed to write anything uh, and uh, not rewrite the sources, they, they were just to be quotations, so the, when I when I had something to add or uh, to discuss about the, the sources, and then there, were, there were several things, mm -hmm. so uh, then, then uh, and suddenly, my colleague Lars Fiske and me, we use each other as uh, sidekicks uh, in our projects. Mm -hmm. So he, he just, uh, we, we just suddenly barge into the comic and, uh, and explain, uh, and we drink it too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's, it's quite, a, it's a nice, it's a nice tool to have to, to just uh, to make that. Um, and that take that distance uh, and, and just snap out of it and, uh, and go to another place instead of, instead of making a sort of uh, far-fetched uh, transition from A to B. Mm -hmm. And just let us come in with our flasks and uh, just say, and we're going this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can also bring up sort of perceptions, I guess, about Munch and his life in that way that are not in the source material or current opinions in the yeah, Norwegian theories public. or uh, mm -hmm. hypotheses uh, and, and stuff that's not that's not scientifically based, but it's just maybe. Mm -hmm. And it's also so, so I, I don't want to present that as anything else than just a subject uh, subjective uh, sure. suggestion. Yeah, it's also entertaining. So. Joe, uh, you you've done this for a number of years. These are <laughs> two images of you. Uh, remember when we did an event a few years ago? The the, the guy who was talking on you, who was talking with you on stage, said, "You look much better in reality than <laughs> you do in your stories." That's uh, my Botox version. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a few years back when you when you started out. Um, so you, you've had this question a number of times before, but um, why not, why the glasses and not the eyes? <laughs> I'm tired of answering um, that question. Yeah, actually, I get it every single time. And so it's an interesting question, and I think over time I've sort of changed my answer. <laughs> um, basically, what I say is um, it sounds a little, it sounds sort of trivial in a way, but I show myself a fair amount in my work, and I, but I would like to signal to the reader that they're not seeing everything about me. And there's that concept of the eyes of the window to the soul. Mm -hmm. And so maybe if you saw my eyes, you'd see me a little more realistically, mm -hmm. what I actually am thinking. And it's, it's, it's sort of a, a mask, basically. Mm -hmm. I, I want distance from the reader in, in some weird way, and maybe the reader should have distance from me mm -hmm. on, on some level, sure. on some level. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, this, this image right here is from some time back. Yeah, I used to work at a, a public library um, so many years ago. This is from um, the third issue of Yahoo. That's right. The, uh, the magazine that you made for uh, in the late 80s and the early 90s. And um, this is at a certain point in your work where you, where you turn to autobiography more and more, wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. you say so? Yeah, and I would say a lot had to do with the... Uh, place I was in North America at the time, a lot of cartoonists were doing autobiographical work. And I guess when you're in your 20s, what can you write about? Um, if you've grown up in sort of suburban environments, but the minor things of life, which is okay, but it, it sort of helps you know, begin to know how to structure a story. Mm -hmm. But I was just one of the other, many other people doing autobiographical work. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, this is like a tr transitional period for you. This is um, in the same series of, of uh, this is in a later issue, um, issue five of you, who was before you started work on, on Palestine, before the trip that changed uh, a lot of things. 
Could you say a little bit about how, um, how you went from making these stories about yourself into a sort of socially committed documentary form? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, this is, this is from an autobiographical piece. And the larger comic is, is about breaking... I was living in Berlin, and I was breaking up with a girlfriend in America, and the first Gulf War was about to start up. And somehow, this notion of the personal and the political catastrophes weaving together in your life and sort of feeding off each other was part of, uh, part of that experience and, and something I wanted to show, how mm -hmm. the worldwide catastrophe, catastrophe reflected my own and mm -hmm. vice versa. Mm -hmm. and, but obviously I was beginning to be, or I was always was, but I was beginning to pull in political stuff in, even into my autobiographical work. Mm -hmm. And while I was living in Berlin, I thought, well, there were the, at that time, there were these really cheap East German flights to Cairo, and you could actually take a bus from Cairo to Jerusalem. This is uh, kind of a, we can't even imagine this today. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm very interested in the Middle East. I'm relatively close. What's stopping me but my own lack of courage from going? Mm -hmm. So after I got over that hump, I just said, I'll go, and I will do autobiography, sort of a a series of autobiographical comics about my experiences there. Mm -hmm. So what became a journalism project started out in my, in my mind as more like a, maybe it'll be like a autobiographical travelogue. Mm -hmm. But once I got there, it, it, the f because I'd studied journalism and never really used it properly, suddenly the journalism kicked in and I was interviewing people and getting the story and what started as autobiography became journalism. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you see anyone else doing something resembling journalism at the time in comics? No, but if I say that, someone will point out <laughs> something that had happened in the Next past. Next slide, in fact, no. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I had this uh, experience with Art Spiegelman where we were talking about it, and uh, he, he pointed out many, many instances of uh, <laughs> I'm sure other did. cartoonists going in the 60s to Cuba. He just knows the history of comics. <laughs> And maybe it's a good thing, but I didn't know the history of comics, so I just felt I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm the first one who's done it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought we could talk uh, just a little bit about the, the topic of collaboration, because okay. um, obviously, as you mentioned, Stefan, you've, you've worked a lot with, uh, with Lars over the years. And... Um, he also has uh, white glasses. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Stolen. One of those things that's stolen. <laughs> he did it first. No. Um, could you say a little bit about that? How it, how it, how it's necessary for you, or how it works in working in tandem with, with the, 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 the story work, behind it, or just how it works? Uh, uh, but both things, really. How you work together yeah. and, and how it. It started by me inviting him to. Uh, you showed some of my. Uh, Autobiographical stuff earlier from Slingel, and he was uh, he was a character in a story that was a, a kind of a reportage from, uh, from from a comic festival in Norway, and uh, we were friends. And, and so <coughs> I drew that, and uh, he was there, and then I wanted him to draw some of the frames and stuff like that, and we we got along fine, and we were talking about uh, stuff, and and then then through the years, we, suddenly there was an exhibition. We made a combined uh, travelogue and uh, biography on uh, a famous Norwegian paint, uh, cartoonist, uh, Olaf Gullbrandsson. So we, made, we just went down to Bavaria, of all places, but that's where the cartoonist went, in, in Simplicissimus. He, he was the, oh. he's probably the, the one internationally famous cartoonist we have. I, I wish I knew the name, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, he, he's almost forgotten in Norway now, so, so okay. <laughs> your excuse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, we made this collaboration, and it, was, uh, it worked really uh, well. And mm -hmm. we also developed some new techniques uh, when we made that book. Do you work together, literally talking about how you're going to collaborate day to day? Uh, not day to day, but uh, I, I guess it was when, when we were doing that, but... Um, Sometimes uh, in a pub, uh, but uh, most of the time on uh, email. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the best ideas came from the pubs. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was very important, both uh, these things. Um, 
a sober, meticulous work and, uh, and, and, and crazy ideas from, mm. the, from the pubs. Do you, do you think in the same way when you work out a comic story or are you... So we, we basically agree on most things, but then we have different personalities. So, so I, I tend to expand uh, and, and be kind of uh, hyperbolic about uh, stuff. And he tries to, to, to <laughs> cut it down and, and, and keep it calm and, and more sober. Not, not literally sober, but... Uh, <laughs> so so that, that's a very good... We have a very good influence on each other. Mm -hmm. so, um, but, but a lot of those techniques uh, about using non-fictional stuff uh, and, and also the, the gonzo aspect or the new journalist aspect with uh, using ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we both... Uh, actually uh, made a, uh, what you call it, a kind of a magazine in, in, in a paperback size that came, uh, was ideally supposed to come annually. It came five issues through 10 years or so. Um, thereby we serialized the monk and uh, that, was, that was my uh, biography and, and he made a biography on Kurt Schwitters, a German Dadaist. Mm. Uh, and he also used uh, me as the sidekick there, so it's it's kind of the same Marvel universe. Or <laughs> wow! Yeah. And do you show him your s when you show him being the sidekick? Do you work that out together, or do you just show him this is what I wrote about us? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a in between. I, I I write a suggestion. I wanted to say something like this, and then he uh, he would write. Uh, I would never say that. I would say, mm. and then uh, and then he could also have some some. Some different, uh, some some extra points or some some funny things to to add to it uh, mm. or to, to sharpen it. So, but basically we work more autonomous then, but uh, autonomous. But it was um, really based on the collaboration in uh, Olaf Ke, just just taking it in uh, new directions. It's very interesting because the style is quite different. Nevertheless, the, you have the same same sort of take on it. Even yeah. if the, the, the stylistic expression is very, it's, it's contrast, but it also the, the surface is, looks very different. But yes. uh, yeah, but it's mm -hmm. it's basically an, an the same approach to how you adopt reality. Uh, try to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've, I've included a page from uh, from a story that you uh, you made, uh, with Harvey Picard. Could you, of course, you mostly known for your, for your own work and, and uh, but could you say a little bit about working with Harvey Picard? Yeah. I'm sure uh, a lot of people would hear about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it was pretty great in a lot of ways, but I feel it was different from Stefan's collaboration because with Harvey, I don't think Harvey wanted this, but I definitely felt like a junior partner. Mm -hmm. um, I would never compose a page like this if, if Harvey just didn't say, he, what he would do is he would send me these um, photocopies of something he'd written, and he would just have a piece of paper. He would make, you know, uh, like six squares or something. Then he'd show a stick figure, and he would label it me. And all these words would come out of its mouth. And then another stick figure in the next panel, me. All these words would come out of its mouth. And I kept thinking, I've got to put all those words in that panel. And it was only really later after we've wor we worked together for some years that I thought, I'd call him up and say, Harvey, this one page should be a two page. Mm -hmm. You know, let's give this a little breathing room. Because mm -hmm. oh, he, he was, he really, what he cared about was the text. Mm -hmm. And um, I sort of, in a way, I let him get away with that. Because I was in awe of Harvey Picard, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, he, in some ways, he saved my ass. Because uh, at a time when I started working on Palestine, it was coming out as a series of comic books, and it was selling really, really miserably. Um, I mean, in, in North America, the last issue sold about 1,700 copies. And it kept going down, each issue kept going down. And by all rights, the publisher should have canceled it. But um, Harvey called me up uh, and gave me work with, uh, he, he, he had something with the Village Voice, this alternative paper in New York City. Mm -hmm. And it was, he would write something about a jazz musician and I would draw it and he would split it evenly with me, which is, is quite, was quite nice of him. I mean, they were buying it because of his name, not because of mine. Mm -hmm. And that sort of month to month, that carried me over. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, you know, every now and then you'd, I'd get a call from him and it was, uh, Joe, it's Avi. Uh, I figured out another way we can make some bread. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've just got to love that. So it, it, was a, it was a very intimate sort of, we, we'd talk on the phone, he'd often call, and we'd spend 45 minutes, and um, one of the most well-read people I've ever known, completely self-taught, he would have read like Portuguese literature from the 1800s. He, he would read it sort of chronologically, just go through. He was always recommending books. He could talk about politics. Never went to college. Um, someone I really admired, mm -hmm. I have to say. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was, it was I, wouldn't, I don't know if it was a collaboration. It just felt like it was an honor, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, but you were just illustrating his uh, yes, manuscripts. Yes, yeah, that's, yes. That's totally different from it's very, the way it's, we it's, work. Yes, it's a very different sort of it's collaboration. Um, have you, I mean, both of you have both uh, worked on commission and at the same time worked on your own stories and books and projects. Um, you, Stefan, you, you've worked for newspapers um, for years and, um, and you've, you've made stories commissioned by journals and newspapers. How do you feel that balance between taking on projects in that way and the commitment and the responsibility that you have and there's also the economical aspect of it and whether it gets in the way of the, the work that you you want to do. It gets in the way and it's all about the, the bread like Harvey said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we just, uh, I can't answer, answer for you but uh, mm -hmm. I just want to, to work on my own stuff. Mm -hmm. So commissions uh, is just a necessity to, to get in the bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, but of course, some commissions are more interesting and uh, a lot more fun than others. Mm -hmm. But basically, I al always have my own projects I'd, I would, I'd, ra I'd rather pursue. Mm -hmm. I, I think there was a time uh, after I finished a couple of really long books, I thought the ideal would be to work for magazines and do pieces for them. It's not exactly the same in that often I generate the idea. I'm, I'm not sure if it's like that for you, but. I will come up with an idea of something I want to do, and then a magazine will decide if they want to use that or not. So the idea, at least, is mine, but I always do feel hampered, mm -hmm. because it's always, okay, we can give you four pages, or okay, we can give you eight pages. Uh, so it depends on the particular piece. And sometimes, you know, I've gone to places for a few weeks where I could probably get a 150-page book out of that experience and I have eight pages to tell a story. Mm -hmm. So what story do I tell or do I put it all together? You know, it's, it, I find it very difficult uh, to do it. But then there are magazines that give me a lot of room. Mm -hmm. But the truth is I'm, I've come to the conclusion that the best thing is just to work on a book that I want to do. If, it, if it's 100 pages, it's 100 pages. If it's 200, it's 200 and have no worries, no obligation and no deadline. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just go on for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> I work pretty well anyway, you know. Yeah. I mean, I've never really needed a deadline, but the problem with deadlines is the calls you get two weeks before the deadline, and, oh, we need to see, we, we want to do the cover now, so maybe you can do the cover of the magazine. <clears throat> All the stuff begins to boil up, and you just, you know, I, I kind of like the freedom of not thinking about how magazines work and what they need. Mm. And then your works on your work on uh, footnotes in Gaza, in a way, grew out of the frustration of doing a story for a magazine. That's right. right. And I was working with a writer. Mm -hmm. That was a good collaboration it was with a writer named Chris Hedges. Mm -hmm. And we went to Gaza together. And all I had to do was the illustrations. But in doing this story, we talked to people, older people, who talked about something that had happened in 1956, where a lot of Palestinians were killed by the Israeli army. Mm -hmm. And he wrote that in his story, but it was cut by the magazine. I mean, not necessarily for nefarious reasons, probably because of space, and probably the first thing to get cut is history. And it, that just bothered me. Mm -hmm. And I, I sort of then made it my mission to go back and concentrate on that particular story and meet all the people I could meet and really tell it well. Mm -hmm. mm. So there's, uh, and, and I guess this, <clears throat> the whole problem with the news media being so much into uh, current events, the mainstream news media has sort of informed your work because it goes against the 
the rhythm in which you work and, and the whole way you structure um, a piece of work. I mean, you, it takes time uh, making these stories and you, but then again, you, your take on it is completely different. Right, so it's it's yeah. it, it's played a role as being in sort of in a, in a position to a, a certain kind of journalism that you 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 were presented an alternative to. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think if anything, I, there's a historical aspect yeah. that I, I give my I allow myself to get into the historical aspect because ultimately I think uh, a lot of what goes on today um, you can trace you can trace things back historically. We mm -hmm. don't we don't just have a world where oh, those people are crazy and these people are the good guys and that's just the way it is. I mean, you could trace a lot of things back to understand why we live in the world we live and mm. that interests me. Yeah. Um, we're going to look a little bit at uh, method and um, this is from your Monk book, Stefan. Um, and you briefly touched on it a while ago, but the way that you made that book, you had... Um, uh, certain sort of rules that you were going to apply source material, right? Mm. So the text is often uh, at verbatim, uh, and then you you sort of play around with the with the images. It's yeah, just... the, the text is uh, that's like quotations. Yeah, I cut them, uh, but I don't. I can't cut a sentence in the middle. Mm. I can take a sentence out and just use that. Mm. You have to because they were babbling uh, people, uh, the Bohemians. <laughs> so, um, so here, here I had uh, the approach. I had probably just seen a Sergio Leone film or something. So, but uh, mm -hmm. there was something about that scene with uh, Strindberg uh, threatening uh, Monk with a gun. I, I just, I have to draw that. Yeah. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. So, and and uh, one thing I, I, I've thought about a number of times reading the book is that the fact that you have all these great anecdotes. And that you, um, in a way, um, your representation of these stories is different from the, the the verbal storytelling. Somehow you, there's a kind of deconstructive element going on in the way that you draw them because we get the entertainment of the story, and and nevertheless it's sort of a caricature of the of the telling of the story. Mm. Is, is, is that something that? Um, yeah, I think that there were. Of course, a lot of these anecdotes are myth-making, yeah. made, I think, uh, probably consciously by uh, the, the people who are telling them, I, even if they're telling it uh, of themselves or about uh, their friends or something. They, they, they were there, but uh, of course, they're not reliable. <laughs> <laughs> you can't trust anyone. Yeah. So, so they, it's just sources and just, just one person saying it. Maybe it was uh, someone, this was, I think uh, maybe this was uh, from Rindberg's uh, ex-wife in her memoirs. Mm -hmm. the, I, I don't remember, but um, no. <laughs> of course you, you, they're they're not the the texts, uh, the, the quotations, uh, the anecdotes. They're, they're they're of course they are not slices of history. They're just no. they're just uh, an old text mm -hmm. claiming to mm -hmm. be uh, inaccurate. But in working that way, you do also sort of um, show us a way in which a certain kind of story is constructed at the time, like, uh, like mythic stories about these, these characters too. I mean, it's, it's part of the, the whole culture of self-representation at the time. So it's, you, you show it to us and yet we sort of smile at it in, in a sense. Whereas in, in, in a number of the more romantic art biographies, it would be... Um, yeah, or in a Hollywood compass. movie, a Hollywood uh, biographic movie, it would be it would be a drama that we were going to take 100% seriously. <laughs> yes. just, uh, no, no, that's not my approach at all, uh, no. on the contrary. Mm. Yeah, I, I, think it's a, it's a, I think it's a ridiculous scene, actually. So uh, <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> it's and, funny. And also, but also I have compassion and I understand uh, Edvard Munch is a, a total nerve wreck at uh, this time and then, uh, and then his crazy friend comes uh, waving a gun at him. It's a, it's a terrible... Must have been, and he's probably a hungover. It's a terrible situation. So, mm. but it's funny uh, when you see it from a distance. I, I wouldn't think it was funny if I was. <laughs> so, so I try to, I try, try to make that, all these aspects, uh, both my distance, but also Munch's uh, fear, mm -hmm. and then what kind of situation he has actually experienced. It mm. Must have been terrifying. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> 
do you think that there is a sense that I get that you both, um, one thing that you both uh, need to avoid in your work is any, any form of sentimentality or sort of a, a certain kind of pretentiousness. Um, so there are ways around that. I mean, there's a lot of humor in, in, in your work too, uh, Joe. Um, I think it, it's, it's not, uh, I'm not so, so scared of sentimentality. I think no. it's different. Some parts of my book can, could probably be called sentimental, uh, the concerning sorrow and so. Mm. I'm, I'm more, uh, it's the pretentiousness and, and uh, the um, trying to be, uh, to tell you that this is the gospel truth. This is, there is no other truth than this. Uh, it's, it's the authoritarian way of telling things. That, that's what I um, react against. So then I use, I can use humor or whatever in cartooning. Uh, you have a whole lot of different uh, methods to, to fight that because uh, it's subjectivity. Mm -hmm. I'm not postmodernist who don't think there is a uh, truth in there, no. but, uh, but it's, it's not exactly as it is presented because it's always presented by a subject. Mm. And of course, a number of the most ludicrous sort of funny stories, you, anecdotes you tell would, could be perfectly well told in a sort of very dramatic way if you chose to do that stylistically. But that's been done odd no <laughs> same. <and laughs> yes. Done to death. Um, you also use, I mean, um, this, this, this is from Palestine, and um, it, well, you, you, could, you could just tell the audience here what, um, what is going on here. John. Okay, this is a, I spoke to a guy who had been detained by Israeli security forces for I can't remember the exact amount of days, I think it was 19 days, something like that. Mm. And one thing I thought was is interesting about comics is, you know, generally you cannot take some, you can't take a camera into a room like this. Actually, I guess Guantanamo proved that <laughs> wrong. Um, to, but in this particular case, uh, n no camera was there. There's no recording of what happened to him. Mm. So is it possible to reconstruct what he underwent as he was um, interrogated by Israeli forces who accused him of belonging to an illegal organization and wanted him to confess. That was basically uh, the idea. So he told his story to me and uh, you know, sleep deprivation, as you've seen from Guantanamo, is a, is a very common and very effective technique uh, in the hands of torture, uh, people who torture. And it was common then in the early 1990s as it is uh, today. And at this point, I think he'd been awake for three days, four days, um, with very few breaks in between. He was allowed to sleep for very short periods before he would again be awakened and kept up for three or four days. And this was toward the end, I think, when he be just simply began to hallucinate about, um, I think, yeah, his daughter dying or, mm. or something like this and, and other people getting sick around him. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something I think you can show in comics. Uh, you can give a person a sense of what the room looked, not necessarily what the room looked like, but his whole experience being hooded and his hallucinations. Mm -hmm. You know, you tr get some depiction of that mm. uh, is what I was trying to get to here. I'm always astonished by this because it's, it's very hard to imagine how it could be Sort of told um, in another form when you look at it. I mean, the the room is silent, and you have these layers of of, of uh, voice. And you have the the oral testimony in the in the boxes in the top. So, and this uh, this was uh, in your in your series uh, for Palestine, right? So, by this time, you must have had a. Um, a fairly good sense of what, what kind of work you were doing? Or? Yeah, a faint, yeah I, I began to understand what I could do with comics uh -huh. in, in this particular context, in the context of journalism. Mm -hmm. You can show people what hasn't been shown, mm -hmm. or, and you can, take, you can take a reader back into the past. Mm -hmm. That became clear to me. And it, it didn't have, because you're drawing the present and the past in the same hand, mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's not such a big break. Mm -hmm. To me, the present and the past is always sort of molded together in mm -hmm. people's consciousness. So um, the seams aren't as, as uh, apparent as they would be in like documentary film, which relies on 
filming a real person telling his or her experience and then uh, recreating it with actors. That mm -hmm. always seems to me like a, too much of a break. Mm -hmm. And um, when you, I mean, it's different when Stefan is, is, is dealing with a story way back in the past and the, the, the people that involved are dead a long time ago. Whereas you have to, there has to be a, a sort of um, a relationship of trust between you and the, the man who went through this. Yes. Right? So he trusts you to tell this story in a certain way. Could you say a few words about how that? Well, it depends. I mean, sometimes what happens is you, you are working with a translator or a guide who is himself or herself trusted. Mm -hmm. uh, people might know that person. They might know the family of the person. They're a respected individual. And that person is taking you to meet someone. That's the in. It's very difficult to knock on someone's door in certain situations and explain who you are and tell me your story about being tortured. I mean, it doesn't really work that no. way. <laughs> but you know, it's it's like you you give you give a bit of time to talking about other things. I mean, there's there's journalistic ways you sort of don't jump into it. Mm -hmm. You want to get to know the person a bit. And in the beginning of this story. I actually show him greeting us, you know, giving us tea, playing with his children, mm -hmm. to show that this is a human being. It's not just some capital V victim. Mm -hmm. Do they, uh, excuse me, do they get to, uh, to approve or to, to uh, see the result before it goes to print or are they just, yeah, they give you your story give me, yeah, verbally they give, and then it's yours? They give me the story and then it's, it's mine. Now, mm -hmm. there are cases when they'll see the story and there are cases uh, now when I can go back to a place easily, I might bring some version of it, and they'll tell me, they'll tell me what it was, if that was correct. Recently, um, uh, just the technology, the way it's changed now, I'm doing a story about indigenous people in the Northwest Territories, and I'm drawing some scenes I, I, where I wasn't at. And what I did is I, I uh, sent these by email to someone who gave them to the individual and he commented on them. Mm. So then I, I actually changed things because I was told, you know, that kind of tree isn't like that. And I said, oh yeah, well, that's a good thing to know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a good thing to know. Uh, so um, I've actually had to change the trees. But yeah, so so I mean, there's there's a usefulness to that, definitely. Yeah. Mm. I was more thinking about some um, some people are uh, when they see it. Uh, it's the subjectivity we're talking about. Perhaps they don't like. The way I don't, I don't, I'm not just suggesting anything here, but just if you have a kind of a contract or agreement or, or something mm. that no, I gives don't. you a license. I, you know, it's funny because different people work in different ways. And when I was in the Northwest Territories in Canada, I was among researchers, and to them, they they actually have a contract they give to the person they're going to interview, where um, it, everything's laid out how things will be done. And to me, okay, that might work in that particular context, but I don't want it imposed upon what I do, because I would rather, rather develop a human relationship than some research, mm. th that the relationship of research ethics, which is a different sort of thing. Journalistic ethics and research ethics are different. And to me, research ethics make sense, but if you apply them to journalism, you're gonna constipate the journalism. If you get someone to, if you get someone to sign a bunch of papers before they're going to tell a story. They might not want to. They might not tell you the story. Sometimes people don't want to tell you the story, and then as you're going out the door, they tell you the story. Mm. You don't. You're not going to say, "Here's some paperwork. Can you fill that out first? I mean, journalism <laughs> doesn't work quite in that manner. Well, so. the, the reason I'm asking them is because we had a story in, uh, in Norway a couple of years ago with uh, a, a female uh, uh, correspondent mm -hmm. who uh, who lived uh, with a family in Afghanistan for uh, for a year or two. Oh yeah. And then uh, and she published a book, and it was a huge hit, and it uh, sold like, worldwide. Right. And then suddenly, one of the, uh, the part of familias, familias from the family she stayed with comes to Norway and, and starts suing her. Right. So I haven't had that experience. <laughs> I'm usually <laughs> telling people what I'm doing. Um, since my first book, I'm able to bring books and explain. Um, I sort of think of it as journalism, as most journalists do. They say, you're working as a journalist, you're doing this for publication. Do you want to talk? Hmm. You, if you want this to be off the record, okay, it's off the record. It's kind of yeah. a verbal contract. It's, it's verbal, yeah. and I, I hold myself to that. I think it's important. I don't, I've heard of this case you're talking about. I don't know the circumstances, and I'm not about to say that all, journal, all journalists behave well 
or if it's they always make themselves understood about what they're doing. Because that's a different thing. Yeah, definitely, that's, uh, that's problematic. Hmm. You also um, said at some point that, um, as I recall, that you, you showed um, people your work, yeah. your comics, just to explain them what, what kind of thing you would do with the material. Yeah. yeah. And, in, and luckily, I've been able to, in some cases, when it's possible, I've been able to bring my books to people and uh, give them to the people who are in the <coughs> books. Mm. And uh, generally speaking, I'd say that the comments have been good. I mean, who doesn't want to be in a comic book? <laughs> so it's, it's, worked in, it's worked in my favor in a lot of ways. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, anything you're doing, anything you're doing is loaded, and you can step on the landmines of that particular profession or, or that particular pursuit. So who knows, maybe one day I'll, I'll be unlucky enough to do the same thing. Um, one thing that is really um, fascinating in, in both, your, both your various works is the place that um, time and recollection, recollection has. And, uh, and this show is from, from Footnotes in Gaza. It's also one of the sequences that um, it's very powerful because of your composition and how you blend historical past and the, the, the present moment of recollection. Um, so this is Faris Barbach. Barbach? I right? can't remember the name yeah. exactly. In uh, young, uh, Khan Yunis, uh, who recollects the massacre in 1956 in Footnotes in Gaza. Um, could you say a little bit about how you would develop a scene like this? Yeah, um, he, he took us to where he found, he was a young child at the time, and he took us to where he found a lot of bo bodies lying against the wall. Mm. Apparently they'd been lined up and shot. Mm. And he was looking down at it, and later on when I was drawing the scene, I thought it would be interesting to show him as an older man and then him as a young child mm -hmm. uh, drawing the scene as he had described it. So this is much as I relected it, and then this is a much more subjective version based on what he had told me. What it took, because there are other pictures of this, but what it took was researching, for example, what this particular castle wall looked like uh, before the buildings had gone up around it, before it had been in a more open area. So I tried to find out, you know, within the limits of what you can research, what the environment looked like um, and what other structures looked like and how it had actually deteriorated over that time. Mm -hmm. But this is, again, what I was saying, you know, the hand that drew this side also drew this side, so there's a, a more seamless blend of going into the past. You can take the reader there kind of with less effort for the reader to sort of say, oh, now we're in the past. It just sort of blends, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And your eyes go back and forth. And, and um, in, in, in something like documentary film, you, you could... Um, use a sort of you know, reconstruction or you could go to the site, but there is some, something particular that happens when it, 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 it's in the same stylistic register <laughs> in the same hand that, that drew it. This is something that I've, I've thought about in looking at your work too, um, Stefan. Is this an aging monk looking back and painting um, a sick child and you have the, the two representations of him in the same panel. Mm. It's like comics character in the more of a traditional portrait. And then um, the whole sequence of, 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 of painting. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's his memory. Yes. Yeah. Can I ask about that? I'm curious, like, what made you decide to draw certain things one way and certain things the other way? Like, Munch's representa the representation of Munch as an older man has a certain realism to it, and then the stuff that takes place in, in Berlin in the 1800s and all that, uh, angular, what, 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 I mean, what were you trying to do with that or what, what made those, how did you make those decisions? The, the extreme stylization of the, the main stories, if, if you could say so, uh, that's because I had to, like you said, I had to invent a lot of the scenes because they are, there are no photos, there's no films, uh, there's just uh, the written words, so I have to, it's all, reconstructions. Now, if I should make that realistic, it would be awkward, and I, I don't think it would work. Mm -hmm. But when it's uh, stylized, it works. And also, uh, the realistic uh, Munch, uh, 
thinking back, and that's that's just to give it another, to give it some weight, and then that it's it's his words, and it's not just bullshit. It's uh, it's did not just cartoons. It's it's his words, and uh, and did you and trust also, his words? Also, I like to draw in different styles, so mm. it's it's also intuitively, but I usually have a plan mm -hmm. most of the time. Do you, um, did you draw him realistically there because you gave me more weight to his words as an older man looking back? Or was he still kind of inventing his myth? No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's more that, that it was just to, to um, at least his words. He, he wasn't writing this then, he was writing it later so it's, uh, to give uh, authority to his words, mm. to his memory. And also to to make the distance. Also, I use the color to to separate the uh, different times. Mm -hmm. So just to I want to mash it, but not mishmash it. If you understand, mm -hmm. I, okay, it has, to be, <laughs> it has to be a certain order in the chaos. Okay. Yeah. So I, I like contrast. Uh, also, I like to use different styles. Mm. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's a, a very beautiful sequence because you you get so so close to. Uh, artistic creation and you you do describe it in a visual form and I, I, I we were talking about the Peter Watkins film and, uh, and yeah. this exact painting and uh, I was quite inspired uh, by that scene but also Edward Munch wrote uh, a really elaborate text about how he made that so that was probably the inspiration for uh, Watkins as well mm -hmm. so, so it was uh, it was all there to, I just remember that I, I had seen it as a child. I mm. saw it later after I drew that sequence, but it has most certainly been on my mind because I was really fascinated. I wanted to be a, a painter at that time mm. when I was a child and, and saw it the first time. So, so that really stuck to my mind. Mm. Yeah, you do have the same sort of attention to, this is from the film. You do have the same sort of attention to the, the moment of, of making art, which I guess it's a possibility when you you actually drawing this because it's 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 I mean it's different than it would be to write it and so often this this sort of significant moment of artistic creation just vanishes from uh, the artistic biography that it would be written. Um, it's, it's pure speculation, of course. The sure. the, the, the images have it. I think it's uh, it's, uh, it's as close as I get, and I wanted it to get as close as I could with his words and. Uh, and yeah, just a decent try for a reconstruction. Mm. It's as close as you can get. And I think that's the same approach Watkins had in his film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's attention to the, to the craft and to the, to the work. Yeah, that, that's, that's a thing I think Joe and me have in common that we, uh, we tend to overwork our Maybe that's true. Yeah, well, yeah, you embellish it with the extreme cross-hatching and detail, and uh, so, so we, we use far yeah. too much time. Uh, I try to loosen up, uh, as you can see in some of the sequences, uh, right. Munch, but, but basically, uh, most of the time, I, I just overwork everything. <laughs> I can never stop. <laughs> was, that, was that rude? <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I, I'll just no. speak for myself from now on. Sorry. Re recently, I, <laughs> recently, I was thinking, I'm, my attention to detail and being really sort of anal about detail, I realized in another life, I could have been a really good bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it began to trouble me. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you don't make, yeah, make that Like a bad though. bureaucrat, let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to the bureaucrats in the room. <laughs> but that's a very good example on uh, just what I was talking yeah. about. Uh, yeah. This, uh, this is not done in an hour. No. I mean, uh, this is uh, from Sefera Gorazde. Is it pronounced Gorazde? Gorazde. Yes. And uh, of course, this, I mean, it's a, it's a um, tableau and a sprawling scene, and it's a lot of movement and enormous sense of detail in this composition here. But this, this is something that you, you developed making that book, because you, there is a change in, your, a change in your style then. Wouldn't you say so? Yeah, I'd say. I mean, um, I never, I never took art classes, so I was very cartoony from the beginning, and that's really reflected in my work Palestine quite a bit. And as time went by, I thought I should try to be more realistic. If this has any pretense to journalism, 
I'll try to be more realistic. It just seemed to fit. Mm -hmm. And I cannot really draw realistically, but it's not as cartoony. And when I want cartoony elements, I can bring them back in, but uh, there's more realism than that cartooniness that I had before, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in, in this book, you have a number of sort of landscape scenes. Yeah, and, uh... well, I stayed a fair amount of time in Garajda, so it was important for me to draw the houses right. And some of those houses are the right houses. You know, it's like I, I wanted, I really wanted someone who lived on that street to say, yeah, that's the house. Yeah. You know, if you can do that, I, if, if it's not always possible to get to that level mm -hmm. of detail, but you know, if I can, then why shouldn't I? Or why couldn't I? Or maybe I kind of order myself to do it, because it's a lot of work then. Mm -hmm. uh, much of the material in this book is, is really, um, it's hard and, and, and brutal and violent. And, and um, could you, it, it has to be hard to work over a certain amount of time with these issues. Um, yeah, I mean, it is. Um, and strangely, as difficult as it can be when you're talking to people, journalistic training kicks in where, you know, journalism is, is a very cold kind of profession. Mm. So, you know, you're getting someone's story like a doctor is getting out a tumor. It's like you're just, let's have, have a few stitches, how much, I don't want to do any damage, just get it out, sew the person up kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of have to be, you have to move things along. People are often very scattered when you're talking to them, so you're constantly herding them toward what the, the story you need, not the story they want to tell. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a cold, it's a cold thing, but when you're in the middle of it, how it helps you is that you're thinking about that so much that you're, you're not engaging with the emotion of what's going on as you are when you are drawing. Because then drawing, is you really have to think about what that person was feeling. It's not about trying to get the story, it's like, what was that person feeling when they were going through this? You're, again, it's interpretive and it's subjective, but it's actually more difficult to draw something than to hear about it, and even sometimes to see it. Mm -hmm. you, in a sense, the, the work that you, you did in Gorashta is also a, a corrective of the general mainstream media presentation of the, of, the, of the war and the conflict there. Um, did you think much about that going in, or are you there for a while to find out what kind of story you want to tell? Well, when I, I went to Bosnia, I wanted to tell a story about Sarajevo because I just had this typical notion, Sarajevo, multi-ethnic, being attacked. And, I mean, there's an element of truth to that, but it's, of course, way more complicated than that. Uh, the, the problem with Sarajevo was, for me, was by the time I got there, people were fed up talking to journalists. Mm. They were cynical about what, what, what good it did them mm. and the nature of journalism itself. You know, you're there to make money. That's how they often looked at it. I was accepted in a certain way because I was a cartoonist. That, oh, you're different, you're a cartoonist. When I got to Garajda, um, and I sort of went because I, sh I thought I should go and see this, but I was trying to resist going. And there was a, a period when, after many years of no one getting in, basically, uh, journalists could go with UN convoys. Now UN convoys were going in, so I could get in. And I kind of just fell in love with the place. And uh, these were people who hadn't told their story. And they, you know, I'd be walking down the street and people would be at their doorway just saying, come in, come in, you know. Uh, they just got sugar with the convoys, and so they were making cakes, and they wanted you to taste their cakes, and they just, and you were an outsider, and to them, an outsider wasn't a representation of cynicism. It was a representation of, oh, if you're from the outside, maybe I can get outside one day. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was a representation of the siege being broken. Mm -hmm. So I was really welcomed, and I thought, no one's gonna tell this story, and I love it here. And uh, so I just made, I made it, you know, my mission to just tell the story. And you do also get a sense of how it is to live in this place, and um, some you get closer to the, the peop actual people you meet than you do when you hear these news constantly coming from these, these places. Um, 
So, uh, and I've, I've, I've read that a number of, of, of people have said that, that you know, it brings them back to being in that specific place at that specific time, reading, reading your book. But I feel sorry for a lot of journalists because it's not always their fault. It's, it's often, they literally have to file every day. They're expected to file a story sure. every day. So they're constantly on this cycle of, you've got to go to the press conference, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've mm. got to get a story at five o'clock. Mm. Whereas I didn't have any of that around and I could just sort of spend weeks in a place. Mm. You've moved in, in recent years to, to this project, um, to, uh, which is, uh, this is a, a, a long panorama that Joe Sacco made from the Battle of the Somme in 1916, which is how long when you fold it out? Uh, I'm trying to remember in meters. Uh, seven or something? Eight meters or eight something meters. like that. And, and, and here, <laughs> here you have this uh, immensity of detail and uh, scene playing out. And it's like this across eight meters. <laughs> uh, is the original, um, excuse me, sure. is original is made on one sheet? Or no, or it's, made on, it's made on uh, like uh, 12 sheets, I think. Mm. And it was a whole production to figure out how to get one to overlap with the other, but eventually yeah. I figured that out with the production person, but uh, yeah. How long did you spend making this? Well, to me, it didn't, it didn't feel like it was a long project. Uh, the research took some time, mm -hmm. but uh, eight months drawing. Mm. That's Just, not, that, to me, long. that's not a long project. <laughs> <laughs> it's not eight years. No, and you it's have not this, eight years. You have this, um, you can, I've spent some time going into this is like a, a fairly. It's, That's really blown up. Yeah, but you can do this um, across the whole. I mean, there are so many scenes there. You can spend so much time with this. Uh, how did you think of that when you were making it? That the kind of moments that you would describe in the battlefield. I mean, it's hard to see in the same image when they were so close. But well, you realize, you know, I, I kind of. Unlike a lot of my work, which is very intimate, and I'm concentrating on certain characters to tell a story, mm. um, maybe this was born out of a certain, I don't, I don't know if I want to say cynicism. Let's say a skepticism about the human race. Mm -hmm. And I, am, I thought, instead of drawing these really intimate scenes, the intimate scenes are actually in here, mm. many intimate scenes. But what I'm trying to do is imagine as if I was a space alien hovering above the Earth on July 1st, 1916, this is what I would have seen. And I would have been indifferent to every single human character in here. I wouldn't even know maybe what was going on, but this is kind of what happened if you were at this distance from this battlefield mm -hmm. and just watching it unfold. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like not getting into the sentimentality of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's very detached. Mm -hmm. And yet not when you see the close-up. No, uh, not you, when, you, you when you really look, you realize there are stories. I mean, to me, um, you know, when I was drawing the stories, I kept thinking, okay, I, this soldier's outline, it's not just the soldier. I, th I kept thinking, okay, this guy has a mother. Mm. And I, every, every drawing I, had, I, I drew, I, every person I drew, I, I kept that in mind. So let's individuate him in some way, you know. Did it appeal to you to work in, in, in a completely different format? I mean, did it sorry, appeal to you to work in a completely yeah, different format? Yeah, it did. I mean, um, it just felt nice to just draw mm -hmm. uh, and not to think about words and where words are positioned and all, all the things that come with uh, doing um, comics panels. And I was very taken with the Bayou Tapestry yeah. um, and I thought, people will read the Bayou Tapestry from left to right. So if it's a long illustration, if we're a Westerner, we also read from left to right. So I, feel, I felt like it's possible to tell a narrative. You can show the day progressing, but it's still the single image. Mm -hmm. And I like that playing with time. I always like playing with time. Yeah. And so your, your next book will be a scroll? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, this is an idea. <laughs> Tapestry. Yeah, you begin with the beginning, the early morning and the left far left and then you go through the day as we progress. Yeah, you go through the day. There's actually a night time too. It starts yeah. the day before, goes into the night, then, then carries into the day of the battle. Mm. We are nearing the end here. We've been going on for a while, but I just wanted to 
sort of talk a little <laughs> bit about satire towards the end. This is a, a cartoon that you made. Well, yeah, if I remember correctly, I thought I uh, think maybe that was held back by the by the um, the editor. Really? Yeah, because he he, he uh, misread it. He didn't understand it was Ku Klux Klan. He said. Well, uh, it, it, this is a right-wing politician, uh, populist uh, politician in Norway, Norway uh, he was at the time. So I was drawing him at the Ku Klux Klan meeting, but uh, the editor thought it was uh, at, at the Satanist uh, uh, um, black mass. And he said, yeah, yeah, okay, I know you don't like uh, the, this man, but, uh, but he's not a Satanist, so we won't print that. <laughs> so he didn't print this? No. But did you have K you had KKK on the back? Yeah. That surprises me that he would. Yeah, it surprised me too. <laughs> and I didn't know until uh, I got the paper without the uh, cartoon. Where was my cartoon? Hmm. No, yeah. didn't, he didn't tell you beforehand? No. <laughs> oh. hmm. It's taken from a book where there are a few of your cartoons are collected by Anders Jever. And Anders Jever, yes. And quite a few right. of them never made it to the newspaper page. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you, on purpose, you've sort of selected things that, that they didn't dare to print, right? Yeah, that was, uh, Anders uh, asked me uh, yeah. uh, if I had some, if mm. I had been uh, censorship, uh, censored or, or uh, yeah. refused. So this is, uh, it's hard to say. It's, uh, I, I drew one of the, 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 the conservative Christian politicians in a Nazi uniform <laughs> because uh, I, I was angry at the way she was treating the gay people. She wanted to mm. have different rules for gay people and for mm. straight people. And I don't think, I think that's, uh, that's not democratic uh, thinking. So, so I, I drew her in an SS uniform, and uh, then they all, uh, the editor said, uh, "I think that's not appropriate. I, I don't want. I don't want to print that." So I think. I think he was probably right. It was kind of over the top. <laughs> See, everyone wants. But I to was be young. A, everyone wants to be in a comic, but no one wants to be in a comic in an SS uniform. <laughs> <laughs> that's the rule. <laughs> I think that's a valid point. Oh. Uh, there. You both have worked uh, with satirical uh, stories and books, and, and this is one of your most recent book, books, uh, um, Joe Bumpf, right. which is a fantastic, fantastic work, uh, which is sort of uh, uh, <laughs> uh, stands out from the other mm. books that you've made in recent years, where you sort of return to uh, satire in a way that you uh, perhaps did more in your earlier work. So what yeah. brought this book about? Uh, sheer rage and anger, mm -hmm. uh, the appropriate thing to bring you to satire, I think. <laughs> uh, feeling that, you know, um, the, way the, American, the way the American government was going, even under uh, Barack Obama, I think he's, I personally think he's been part of the problem now at this point when it comes to drones and uh, what's happening around the world. So I basically, basically the premise of the book is Michelle Obama wakes up with Richard Nixon, and she doesn't know it's Richard Nixon. It's to her, it's, it's Barack Obama. And no one notices that it's Barack Obama, but he's drawn as Richard Nixon, and he knows he's Richard Nixon the whole time. So, uh, but this was a lesson to me, because I was, as I was telling you, the, uh, my six months royalties for all of North America for the second period this book was out, the six month royalties was $17. So, uh, <laughs> um, it's, maybe I won't keep going with satire. <laughs> or maybe I'll become a better satirist. <laughs> I actually got into satire to make money. Oh, is that I, right? Yeah, I wanted to make comics, but, uh, but for, a new, for a newspaper, they, they, they pay like, uh, like money. Wow. Yeah, and then you didn't get <laughs> not that bread. for... A, and it's, it's one drawing, and it's not, it's not a hundred. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you get real money. Mm. That was a luxury for a comic artist, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so I needed that. Mm -hmm. and then, of course, I was uh, full of rage as well, so that mm -hmm. helped to do mm -hmm. the satire. <laughs> of course, these are also anxious times for political cartoons, I mean, yeah. and the kind of uh, geopolitical conflict that some of these drawings have stirred. Um, and you, you had a response to the shootings in Paris after the Hebdo events, which sort of modified the nobility of the, or the noble character of the satirical impulse, I guess you could say that. Is, isn't that Yeah, a, to me it's very complicated because um, ultimately I, I believe in total freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And I do feel people should be able to draw what they want. But to me, 
as something I bring up. I, to me, drawing is, lines on paper are a weapon. Mm. And I use them as a weapon. That's how I think of them. When I'm doing this satirical thing, I want to hurt. Uh, that's the idea. But I don't think, I don't, I think you have to be very careful with these weapons. And, you know, in a world where a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds are being put together, how wise is it to stir waters up? I realize you have the right to do that, but sometimes I question uh, the wisdom of doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was trying to get at. Mm. I totally disagree. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, that's, uh, I just... I, I don't think uh, cartooning is a weapon. I think that's uh, expressing mm -hmm. opinions. Uh, weapons is what uh, came into the uh, editorial room of uh, Charlie Hebdo. Uh, to compare these things, um, and that the cartoonists should be more respectful or cautious because uh, you have terrorists and, uh, and people with real weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's... Well, yeah, it's not a, think definitely not a literal weapon, yeah. But, you no, know, I, I think, think... it's a dangerous thing to say that because uh, a lot of people say that it's, it's apologetic for, for the terrorists. Mm, I don't think it's in a... Well, I, I don't feel it's in a... Uh, that's apologism for the terrorists. I don't feel that. I think there, I, there are instances in history where cartoonists um, have used drawing to be racist. Um, and yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It's not a literal weapon. Literally, people were, were murdered at the offices. There's just, that's not in question. But when you think of the racist work that was done in the 30s by certain cartoonists, that was done by Rwandan cartoonists, um, I'm, I'm questioning the wisdom of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And of in, that, in that case, but to me, it's part of stirring up a population. And yes, you're right, it's not a literal weapon with bullets, but it's a, well, I should have said it's a, it's a, a sort of a weapon, perhaps. Maybe I should have said it that way. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful expression with certain implications that are sometimes out of your Yeah, but it's not, it's not as powerful as a hand grenade or a Kalashnikov. I'm taking it very literally because sure. yeah. it, it no, literally I mean, you're happened. Right. You're right. They, they, they met uh, satire with these weapons, so, so yeah, it's not the same thing. Uh, it's very literal, so... Yeah, okay. Yeah. This is, Maybe I'm stupid. No, 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 I mean, I... <laughs> I, I know, understand in, what in you mean by a weapon, but it's, it's a method. It's, 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 it can be effective, and it, it, it may be... Uh, influential uh, on the opinion and stuff, but uh, it's, no, it's not, not, it's a, not the weapon no. itself. It's not, it's, it's not the weapon. machete who killed no, the... No, it's not. It's not. No. So, um, I'm just... We're finishing now because we've been going on for one hour and 15 minutes. Um, finishing on a good foot. <laughs> <laughs> People probably need some fresh air. Uh, oh, actually, I have uh, something that is... that I've, I've, I've no good reason to show this, but uh, there is this portrait that you made, um, Stefan, of, of Keith Richards, and I know that you, Joe, is, you, you love the Rolling Stones. Uh, <laughs> when did you make, make this? For what, what was the, do you remember? Well, that was just uh, for, for the, the comic I made with uh, Lars Fiske, the, the annual comic that we make, mm -hmm. with uh, just our stuff. The, the only criteria to be there is you either have to be Lars Fiske or Stefan Kvarland, and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and I wanted to draw Keith Richards, and also there was an anecdote about him that I wanted to illustrate, that we, we chopped up his father's ashes oh, with uh, cocaine. he snorted it, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but it turns out uh, it, it was not, not true, true, because, uh, no, uh, it, was not, uh, it was not cocaine, it was just his ashes. <laughs> <laughs> and that actually, you, you, uh, you've... Uh, yeah, that's right. This is a, 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 bad, <laughs> um, a bad scan, but uh, this is the, a story you made when you went to uh, a Stones show. Um, right, in 1994 or so. Yeah, yeah. you have this very <coughs> so amusing where you, you have Mick, Mick Jagger running oh, yeah. back and forth on the stage. In his, his aerobics class. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is coming to terms with being a, a Stones fan and seeing them live in, in the 90s. Um, <laughs> we'll round it out off there. Uh, Joe Sacco will be at Trun's Small Bookstore tomorrow at 5 o'clock. And we'll go deep into this. Uh, it won't be like the Stones. We won't use the exact same set list tomorrow. So it's a different set list for tomorrow's show. So thank you for coming out. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.